Hi, it's Richard Dwyer, richarddwyer.com. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, I'd like to direct everyone's attention to a case that is currently under appeal. It's a double homicide case. It's the state of Kansas versus Dana Chandler. Now, you might have heard of this case. It's been featured on a bunch of shows like 48 Hours, right? They have people there and, um, you know, Dana Chandler's daughter has some suspicion that Dana Chandler was behind the death of her father and, you know, all of these folks are on camera getting emotional telling you what a terrible person Dana Chandler who was the ex-wife of one of the murder victims was now let's talk about the crime for a moment because I feel based on these facts that it is really an outrage that Dana Chandler was ever tried for this double homicide it really stretches the imagination to believe that the prosecution even came close to establishing guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, which according to the jury they did. Right? Dana Chandler got convicted of this double homicide. In a word, it's outrageous. Let me also point out too. While I've handled some criminal matters, I'm really a civil attorney, right? I'll get dragged into criminal matters when the client asks. But I'm really a civil attorney, and I've handled very contentious <clears throat> multi-million dollar divorce cases, right? Very contentious divorce cases where, as you could imagine, the allegations include things like domestic violence, right? I've been on both sides of it. I've represented victims of domestic violence, right? I've also represented people accused of being the abuser. I understand how tense these things can be, right? But have you ever heard of a case in which the prosecution accused and tried a defendant for murder that the prosecution could not prove the accused was even in the state where the murder was committed. Right? Understand, Dana Chandler lives in Denver, or at least she lived in Denver at the time of this crime. The murder takes place in Topeka, Kansas, hundreds of miles away. There is no evidence here that Miss Chandler was even in the state of Kansas when the murders were committed. What I want people to do, because the internet is interactive, you actually have an opportunity here to leave comments in the comment section to the video, right? For those of you who believe there is evidence that Dana Chandler is in the state of Kansas, right? I understand there was a hint of some evidence concerning Waikiki, Kansas. What I want you to do is to list that evidence here in the comment section to this video. Let me also go one step further. Understand when anyone, including myself, makes a video here on YouTube, all of us, any member of the general public, even those involved in the prosecution of this case, can post a rebuttal video. If you create a rebuttal video to this video, please feel free to leave the link to that video in the comment section to the video. Now, let's just figure this one out. 
Dana Chandler lives in Denver. Her husband and his fiance are killed in Topeka, Kansas. Right? As you can imagine, the prosecutor weaved a tale at trial about how Dana didn't want the divorce. How Dana was jealous of her ex-husband for being able to move on from their marriage. How Dana was particularly upset when the husband in a five-minute telephone call told Dana of his plans to get married. Right? That's according to the prosecution. Prosecution goes one step further. They point out that the husband got a protection from abuse order against Dana that Dana violated. Right? Think about it. Dana is supposed to have been so out of control that the husband had to get what in California we would call a temporary restraining order against his ex-wife just to keep his ex-wife away. Now, the prosecution's theory, given that no one saw Dana Chandler in the state of Kansas the day of the murders, right? No one with any certainty sees her. There are no receipts of her buying gas anywhere along the trip, right? No receipts, no videotape, no forensic evidence of her at the crime scene, right? No DNA match on the hair, no fingerprints, nothing like that. So the prosecution's theory, and understand, prosecutors have their own agenda, right? They understand that getting convictions helps their career. They understand getting convictions raises their profiles, right? The prosecution's theory of the case is a little bit muddled. It's actually two theories. The first is that Dana Chandler's car got 27 miles per, per gallon. And that while it's true, on a full tank, she couldn't make the round trip without stopping. The claim from the prosecution is that she had gas cans in the car that would allow her to pull over to the side of the road and refuel her car without stopping at a gas station, without generating a receipt, without being caught on film. Right? So, the prosecution's theory is that with the help of gas cans, she could have gotten to Topeka, Kansas, done this double homicide, hopped back in her car, and not made it all the way home, but made it out of the state to somewhere in Nebraska where she could then refuel. Now, there are a host of problems with this. Why isn't all of this considered mere speculation? Isn't there a big difference between she could have done it this way and we have evidence that she did it this way? Also, how would they know the route Dana Chandler took either to the scene or away from the scene? Right? They have no evidence, folks. How do they even know that in leaving Topeka, Kansas to get her way home after allegedly committing a double homicide, she would decide to drive through Nebraska? Here again, 
Isn't that just speculation? So the prosecution has another theory. And this one's ridiculous, right? The uh, theory is that she stops at a town where she supposedly buys a book, right? Someone, by the way, this is on her way in, right, to do the murder. I guess the idea is that Dana Chandler wanted to do some reading before she killed two people. Right? That she had to stop at this store, even though she has gas cans in the car. She stops at this store to pick up a book on her way to a double homicide. Now, this is supposed to have taken place at Waukini, Kansas. The problem is that the evidence here is so non-existent that even the prosecution understood that it needed to develop another theory, the gas can theory, to present to the jury at trial. Folks, there's no receipt whatsoever of Dana Chandler ever buying a book, ever in Waukini, Kansas. None whatsoever. None. This theory seems made up of whole cloth. I'm guessing they encountered someone who thought, you know what, maybe one of our customers possibly, perhaps conceivably, could have matched Dana Chandler's description. Right? As I've said, even the prosecution understood they couldn't lead with this theory because there are no financial records to support it. Right? So then we get to the trial. And we have, in my opinion, let me be clear here, I need to protect myself from any kind of defamation lawsuit. I'm offering an opinion here, not a statement of fact. In my opinion, there's clear prosecutorial misconduct at the trial that results in Miss Chandler's conviction. Right, let's go through it. The first, you remember that protection from abuse order? didn't exist. The prosecutor in her closing statement in a purely circumstantial evidence case, right? There's no direct evidence. No direct evidence that Dana Chandler is even in the city where the crime is committed at the time the crime's committed. Right? No evidence. There's certainly no evidence that she's at the crime scene. None. Zero. Zip. Nada. So, of course, in the closing statement, <clears throat> the prosecutor points out that there was a protection from abuse order. Right? That a judge agreed that Dana Chandler needed to be kept away from her husband, that Dana Chandler was a danger, right? And the prosecutor went further and said that the order had been violated. Here's the problem, folks. There is no protection from abuse order. Right? There is no protection from abuse order. The jury was misled by the prosecution in a case that was thin on evidence. There is no judge, no judge 
who granted a protection from abuse order against Dana Chandler. So you had a jury thinking that this woman was subject to a restraining order. That this woman had such a dodgy relationship with her ex-husband that the court had to order her to stay away. Now understand, let's be clear on the terminology, right? A protection from abuse order is different from a protective order issued in a divorce case. This is a separate proceeding. This is what the prosecution said was issued. It wasn't issued. The prosecutor can claim that she misspoke. It's an error. I would argue it's a reversible error. Right? The jury got the feeling that Dana Chandler was dangerous, had already been judicially determined to be someone who needed to be restrained with a protection from abuse order when there was none. Let's talk about another act of abuse by the prosecutor. And this one's a doozy. The prosecution theory is that there's a five-minute phone call. They even have a date when this supposedly happened. July the 5th, in which Dana Chandler's ex-husband is supposed to have said to her, Hey, I'm getting married. I'm engaged. And this five-minute telephone conversation was supposed to be the fuse that lit Dana Chandler's bomb. So that Chandler then decides, that's it. I don't want him moving on. I'm going to travel to his state. I'm going to buy gas cans. I'm going to travel to his state. And I'm going to kill him and his fiance. Right? Here's the problem. How does the prosecution know what was said in this five-minute conversation? Right? The prosecutor weaves some tail, points to this five-minute conversation. Now, Dana's ex-husband is dead. He didn't testify. Dana Chandler never testified about what was in this five-minute conversation. Folks, this is speculation made up by the prosecution. The prosecutor's trying to get a conviction. The prosecutor sees that there's a five-minute conversation and decides that they're going to then make up a story about what was said in the conversation. Right? Outrageous. Simply ridiculous. You're dealing with a double homicide case where the prosecutor has a burden. They need to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The way this prosecutor decided to do so was by coming up with dialogue in a five-minute conversation that's made up. That's literally just speculation. Right? He must have told her in this five-minute conversation that he was getting married, and that must have caused her to fly off the handle in a murderous rage. Right? Come on. You know, understand, if you're in the jury, and you're hearing a prosecutor say, in this five-minute conversation, he told her that he was engaged, you're assuming that's factual. Right? It's not. This is speculation. In fact, it's speculation of the worst kind. Right? 
this is a case where it really boils down to motive and opportunity. The prosecutor had to create a reason why Dana Chandler would want to kill her ex-husband. It then uses a five-minute conversation that it knows nothing about other than that a five-minute conversation took place and then speculates in front of a jury about what was said in that five-minute conversation. Right? If they did this in a movie, they would have to say that the movie was inspired by actual events. Not that the show was reality-based. Things like this should not happen in a murder trial where the standard is guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Right? Let's talk about another instance of prosecutorial misconduct. And it's outrageous. The judge apparently had a prior run-in in a different case with the prosecutor, where the prosecutor, of course, in her presentation, motioned to people in the gallery, onlookers, right, and had them, you know, had the jury look at the onlookers, right, and then, you know, talked about the onlookers. So the judge actually warned the prosecutor, said, look, I remember what happened in that case. I don't want you doing that in this case, right? Because it's prejudicial. Pointing to people in the crowd and trying to have the jury draw some inference, right? It's prejudicial. We want people convicted of crimes they've committed not community sentiment, right? The facial expressions of people in the gallery really shouldn't be received into evidence or considered by a jury. So, of course, you know what the prosecutor does. The prosecutor is, I believe, giving her closing some part of the trial like that in violation of the judge's warning, she then looks into the gallery and sees Dana Chandler's sister. And in front of the jury, she motions to Dana Chandler's sister. Right? At the appellate hearing, the prosecutor said, well, you know, she was basically giving me a mean look or something like that. That's how ridiculously petty this whole thing is. Folks, it's a double homicide. It's a double homicide. Someone who has a mean face in the gallery shouldn't throw any prosecutor off their game, especially after the judge has warned the prosecutor not to engage in that kind of behavior. But yet here, this prosecutor, the same one who comes up with, you know, what was said in a five-minute conversation that the prosecutor did not listen in on and doesn't have a statement from either of the people involved in the conversation, the same prosecutor who comes up with a protection from abuse order where there is none, right, claims that the defendant ignored the order without any evidence of that, right, since the order didn't exist. Well, I guess taking on Dana Chandler is not enough. She decides to motion to Dana Chandler's sister sitting in the gallery in front of the jury. So let's cut through all the ridiculous narratives. I understand Dana Chandler's daughter, you know, has a suspicion that mom did the crime. Hey, that's not evidence. That's not evidence. I can tell you as a divorce attorney, 
right? Many times, as you can imagine, kids in these divorce cases take sides. You know, as much as parents want to believe they're parents of the year, many kids are angry toward one parent or both parents. You know, interviewing the child of a criminally accused on a crime show like 48 Hours or Dateline might make for compelling television. But it's not good evidence when the kid wasn't at the crime scene, has absolutely no idea what happened at the crime scene, right? Really, it's just offering speculation. So here, what does the evidence boil down to? With regard to the actual crime, right? Before we talk about motive, let's look at the actual crime. What links Dana Chandler to the actual crime? I would argue we have no evidence. Right? There's no forensic evidence linking Dana Chandler. None. To the crime scene. One of the big pieces of evidence that the prosecution admitted was that Dana Chandler was relieved to learn that a alleged prosecution witness had died. Right? Chandler supposedly was relieved to hear that. Folks, unless you have direct evidence, that evidence is not compelling. Many people falsely accused of a crime, right? will be relieved if they hear that any part of the prosecution's case has fallen apart. It means you're that much closer to getting home. Also, apparently in a call from the jail, right? Because, of course, the prosecution had people around Dana Chandler mic'd up. And, of course, when you talk with someone from prison, the call is recorded, right? In a call from the jail, Dana Chandler apparently talked about a hair sample she had given the prosecution, right? People need to understand that there's no DNA match here. None of Dana's hair is found at the crime scene. None of it. So if you hear that the DNA doesn't match or what have you, or if you give a sample of DNA to the police and then are worried, right? That could easily be interpreted as, hey, police, don't frame me, <laughs> right? You know, I've cooperated here in giving you a DNA sample, right? I hope I'm dealing with honest police and not cops who are then going to, you know, leave a sample of what I've given them at the crime scene. Wasn't that the theory put forth by O.J. Simpson in the Nicole Brown Simpson case? Right here, the prosecution presents this in a case where they have no witnesses who see Dana Chandler at the crime scene, no forensic evidence whatsoever, none linking Dana Chandler to the crime scene, right? None. No idea on how Dana Chandler leaves the crime scene, allegedly, because they have no evidence. None. Zero. Zip. Of her on the way away from the crime scene. They're speculating she goes through Nebraska. That's rampant speculation. No witnesses support it. Right? In a case with no direct evidence, a purely circumstantial case, right? No forensic evidence at all. A case where the prosecutor lies about there being a protective and a uh, protection from abuse order, right? In that case, 
the best the prosecutor can do, the absolute best, is to talk about the criminally accused relief on a witness dying, right? And when we say a witness, not a witness that places Chandler at the murder scene, right? A witness dying and her concerns over DNA when none of her DNA was found at the crime scene. So forgive me if I say, look, let's hope all of us in a country where we want everyone, everyone to receive their proper constitutional protections, right? We as Americans have certain rights. There is no king in the United States. Right? The burdens on the state to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Let's hope that the court in Kansas does the right thing and throws out this travesty of a double homicide murder conviction. Right? I'm sure the victims were great people. I've watched multiple crime shows on this crime where they talk about what a loving couple they were and how you know, the uh, murder really devastated a lot of people. Okay, great. And I understand Dana Chandler was not happy with being divorced. Okay, fair enough. Gee, if that's the standard in pinning a double homicide on someone, wow, a lot of my clients are in trouble. Right? No eyewitness testimony, no forensic evidence. Right? A prosecutor making up what was said in five-minute phone calls. I encourage everyone to fully research this case. It is ongoing and it's terrible. Dana Chandler has been in prison for years. She needs to be released. This is an outrage. Right? I understand the prosecutor might have some gut feeling that Dana Chandler is guilty. That's not the legal standard in the United States of America. Right? If the prosecution doesn't have evidence that establishes guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, they should not be bringing a prosecution for murder against the defendant. They did here, and it's a tragedy. Let's hope Dana Chandler gets out of prison. Again, this is a call for the state of Kansas to do the right thing. I encourage you to research this case thoroughly. That's how I see it. Thanks for stopping by. I encourage anyone with any evidence on this case or with any, you know, referrals to further sources on this case to leave your comments and links in the comment section to this video. Thanks for stopping by.